Good morning. It's my great honor and pleasure this morning to introduce Dr. Susan Lozier. She's a physical oceanographer and a distinguished professor at the Nicholas School of the Environment at Duke University. Upon completion of her PhD at the University of Washington, she was a postdoctoral scholar at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and then she joined the faculty at Duke in 1992. Professor Lozier was the recipient of an NSF Early Career Award in 1996, the Bass Chair for Excellence in Research and Teaching in 2000 at Duke, and the Duke University Award for Excellence in Mentoring in 2007. She was named an American Meteorological Society Fellow in 2008, a Distinguished Professor at Duke in 2012, a Fellow of the American Geophysical Union in 2014, and a Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 2015. She currently serves as President of the Oceanography Society. Her CV lists 70 publications in journals such as Nature, Nature Geosciences, Geophysical Research Letters, and Science. Her research interests are in large-scale ocean circulation, as a renowned expert in the state of the meridi global meridional overturning circulation, she's the international lead for the observing system known as overturning in the subtropic, uh, subpolar North Atlantic program, or OSNAP. The purpose of OSNAP is to assess the critical measurements needed in a multi-decadal observing system uh, for the uh, Atlantic meridional overturning circulation and to provide ground truth for model simulations. I'm sure she will tell, be telling us uh, more about all of this in her talk. I'm looking forward to it. Mostly, I'm looking forward to her telling us who came up with that OSNAP acronym anyway. <laughs> As an obscure factual tidbit about Susan, I learned that she has undergraduate and master's degrees in chemical engineering and worked for several years in private industry in that field. I imagine this was good training for Susan, as there must be a lot of similarities between a chemical factory and the plumbing of the subpolar North Atlantic. I would add a personal note here, as a fellow resident of North Carolina, I have had the great pleasure to collaborate with Susan on a number of statewide issues. I have always found her delightful to work with. She has a great sense of humor and is always fully engaged in what she's trying to accomplish. I have no doubt that sense of engagement will contribute to the great success of OSNAP. Dr. Lozier has been asked to leave plenty of time for discussion, so please hold your questions, uh, keep your questions in your head uh, until she is finished, and then we'll have plenty of time for her to uh, interact with you at the end of her talk. So now, would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Susan Lozier. Thank you, Fred, for that kind introduction, and thank you to the Ocean Sciences Planning Committee for the opportunity to present this plenary lecture. I'm going to answer the, Fred's first question right off. My 20-year-old son at the time, named OSNAP, gave it that, gave it that name. The um, story that I'm going to talk about, the, dec the uh, decade after the day after tomorrow, actually starts in 1751. So I'm going to take you back there, because in that year, there was a sea captain, a British sea captain named Henry Ellis, who was transiting the Atlantic in the tropical region. And he stopped in order to make the first measurement of the deep ocean temperatures. So armed with just a wooden bucket and valves fitted in that bucket so they could capture water at particular depths and a very, very long rope, Henry Ellis and his crew laboriously lowered that uh, wooden bucket over the side of the ship time and time again to create that temperature change, or to look at the temperature changes as a function of depth. And what he recorded in a letter was that as they lowered the bucket further and further, the temperatures of the waters decreased proportional to depth until the bucket was lowered at 3,900 feet. And though they kept lowering it below that, the temperature stayed the same. And that temperature was 30 degrees colder than the air temperature at the time. Now, even though Ellis was recording all this in the letter, they weren't really that interested in what these temperatures meant for the science community at the time. But he did note they were very happy to have discovered a source of cool waters for their, to chill their wines and cool their baths 
in that vastly disagreeable tropical climate. So that letter was sent on to the Royal Society of London, and not until 1800 um, did anybody really look at it. And and the person who looked at that then was Count Rumford. And Count Rumford was very interested in how those tropical waters at depth were so cold. In fact, those waters at depth were colder than the air temperatures ever were. And so after thinking for a while, Count Rumford realized that those cold waters had to have had their origin at high latitudes in the surface. And from that, he conjectured that if there are, is, is cold water coming from high latitudes down to depths in the tropical ocean, there had to then be a return of warm waters back up via the surface flow up to the high latitudes. And so in two very simple um, sentences, Count Rumford described what we, even school children know today as the global conveyor belt. Basically, surface waters at high latitude, when they lose their heat, Those waters sink, they spread to places, distant places across the globe, they upwell and return um, to the high latitudes of the North Atlantic. It wasn't though until 100 years or more than 100 years after Count Rumford, or after Henry Ellis' single measurement of the deep temperatures, that we had more information about the overturning circulation. And so in the 1920s, the Germans had a series of cruises in the Atlantic that provided our first trans-basin view of the properties um, along the basin. And so while uh, Rumford had conjectured there was a connection between the tropical waters and the high latitudes uh, surface waters, these trans-basin sections actually showed that connection, so they gave some spatial context. So we see the salinity, high salinity waters of the North Atlantic deep waters originating from the surface and spreading through the ocean. And then not until several decades later did we actually have a temporal context for the overturning. And that temporal context came as part of the Geosex program, which is the Geochemical Ocean Science Section Study Program. And there, geochemists measured tritium, which is a byproduct of the nuclear bomb testing that was conducted both by U.S. um, and uh, the Soviet Union in the 50s and 60s. And what we saw for the first time was really that conveyor belt in action. And so it became, um, and we were looking at this section from 70 north to the equator, we can see the slow encroachment of the tritium in those decades since it was taken up by the surface waters. And so this, for the first time, really illustrated the capacity of the ocean as a reservoir. And that capacity of a reservoir is acutely apparent today when we talk about the reservoir of the ocean for anthropogenic carbon dioxide. So what we're looking at here is essentially a transect of the anthropogenic carbon dioxide laid out along that red line, which is uh, in the inset. So moving from uh, Iceland down uh, across the Atlantic, eastward across the Southern Ocean, then up to the Pacific, finishing at the Aleutian Islands, we're looking at the penetration of the anthropogenic carbon dioxide into the deep ocean. And what we see is that in the North Atlantic, we see a penetration of that anthropogenic carbon dioxide into the deep ocean. And we understand today that about 30 or 35 percent of the anthropogenic carbon dioxide released since the start of the Industrial Revolution is now in the ocean. And so the ocean's ability to be a capacity for that uh, carbon dioxide has very strong implications for our climate um, and its evolution. And so understanding the fate of the ocean as a carbon reservoir depends critically on our understanding of the overturning variability, in large part because we understand the magnitude of that carbon dioxide that's being carried by that overturning circulation to depth. So how well do we understand the overturning variability? Well, decades ago, or even a decade ago, I think the answer, or I might have answered you really quite simply, And that is that we had every expectation that as high latitude waters warm, perhaps because of the increasing carbon dioxide, those waters would be less prone to mixing. So the production of deep water would diminish, and that would diminish the overturning circulation, and hence it would diminish the um, amount of poleward heat flux that, that, um, that is accompanying that overturning circulation.
So for years, in fact, that global conveyor belt paradigm was used to explain uh, changes on millennial timescales. So paleographic proxies of um, bottom ocean temperatures were used uh, to explain warmings and coolings according to this conveyor belt paradigm. So when there was a uh, cessation or diminishment of the overturning circulation, we expected there then um, to be um, a warming of the, of the deep waters. But the, um, in, the 19, in those changes, those millennial scale changes though, um, were really too far removed to sort of warrant, or had too long time scales to warrant the attention of physical oceanographers, who really at that time were more concerned with changes on time scales of years to decades. However, um, a study in the mid-1990s really changed that remove. So there were recorded changes in ice sheets, both in Antarctic and Greenland, that showed that the global atmospheric temperature could change abruptly on the time scale of years to decade. And so following on that study and, and other ones in the late 1990s, there was a National Research Council report that came out called Abrupt Climate Change. So this was published in 2002 and in some ways sounded the alarm about abrupt climate change, saying that these large-scale changes could come about um, in time scales of years to decade. And the supposition was those large-scale changes in atmospheric temperatures would come about because of changes in the, uh, overturning, in the overturning circulation. So this concern about the um, abrupt climate change got the attention of not only those in oceanographic studies or in climate science and policy, but also got the attention of Hollywood. And in 2004, a movie came out, The Day After Tomorrow, which portrayed the onset of an ice age in a period of 24 hours, which was quite a stretch for, that, for the science. But I must say, as bad as the science was, I think the science got better reviews than the acting in that movie, at least for what I remember. So. But on the non-Hollywood side, on the scientific front, there was also concern. And that concern was heightened in 2005 in a study that came out in Nature that talked about the reduction of the overturning circulation by 30% over five decades. So based on synoptic surveys, one taken in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, and 90s, the same latitude in the North Atlantic, about 25, 26 north, Bryden et al. Uh, determined that there was this long-term decline in the overturning circulation, and 30% decline is certainly sizable at that time. So the community started having a very strong focus on both sides of the Atlantic, had a very strong focus then on the overturning circulation. And about that time, the vocabulary changed as well, because we realized that the global conveyor belt, really there was no mathematical um, construct for the global conveyor belt. And instead, we started talking about the meridional overturning circulation, or MOC, which is really is the zonal and depth integrated northward transport of the waters at any particular, um, uh, any particular latitude. But though the language began to change, we didn't talk about the, over, the global conveyor belt, and we talked about the MOC, many of our working assumptions about this circulation feature remain the same. And these five main assumptions are listed here. So at that time, 10 or 15 years ago, we understood that the overturning varied on time scales of years to decades. We understood that the waters in the lower limb of the overturning circulation were constrained within deep western boundary currents. We had expectations that the surface flow of that upper limb of the overturning circulation was carried along the surface pathways from the Gulf Stream up to the northern North Atlantic. We thought we could measure the overturning circulation at one latitude, and that would give us information about the temporal variability of the overturning at another latitude. And we also have very strong expectations that overturning variability results primarily from the variability in deep water mass formation. So in the time I have with you this morning, I'm going to examine each of those assumptions and see where we are today. So for the first assumption about the scale of the variability, um, shortly after um, there were the studies about the, the concern about the abrupt climate change, a UK and US program was initiated 
called Rapid Mocha. And what was put into place was our first observing system that provides a direct measurement of the overturning circulation. And this is at 26 and a half degrees north in the North Atlantic. So using moored instruments across the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and both of the western boundary and the eastern boundary, as well as using cable measurements through Florida Strait and using ocean surface winds measured via satellite, this observing system is providing that first direct measure of the overturning circulation. After one year of measurements, in 2007, a publication came out showing the time series of this overturning circulation. The total overturning circulation is what you see in red, and you see the three components. In blue is the Florida Straits transport, in black is the wind-driven component of the Ekman transport, and then the mid-ocean transport is shown there in purple. But I want to draw your attention to the red curve, and I want you to recall that I said just two years prior to this, based on five synoptic sections done over five decades, it had been estimated that there was a decline in the overturning circulation by 30%. In one year, this measurement showed us that the overturning circulation could change by a factor of five or six. So we had no idea until this time series came out that there was such large changes on seasonal, intraseasonal timescales. So we had to really rethink our idea about that uh, MOC variability. The second assumption has been with us for 50 or almost 60 years, and that is that the deep waters are channeled through deep western boundary currents. Stommel, many decades ago, theorized that if there's a mass source to the deep waters, based on what's called steady vorticity dynamics, it required that all the interior waters move poleward. Not everything could be poleward, so deep western boundary currents were appended in order to move those deep waters equatorward. And ever since, there's been a strong expectation that if we measure in the deep western boundary current, then we're measuring the lower limb of the overturning circulation. Tracer studies, some float studies in the past two decades started giving us some ideas that that wasn't the case. And so a colleague of mine, Amy Bauer from Woods Hole, the two of us designed an NSF-supported study that went in to actually look at the pathways by which those deep waters moved from the subpolar gyres to the subtropical gyres. And what you're seeing here is the results of our study, where we went up into the deep western boundary current, purposely placed um, RAFOS floats in the Labrador Sea water in the deep western boundary current and tracked them for two years. Contrary to expectations, these floats did not follow the deep western boundary current. Instead, this is a diagram we fondly call a spaghetti diagram. Instead, what we see, the floats move on into the interior. Some of them move eastward into, to recirculate in the subpolar gyre, but many move into the subtropical region through interior pathways. Subsequent studies have shown that these interior pathways hold not just for the Labrador seawater, but for the overflow waters. Now, our measure of these both observational floats is limited, but what I'm showing you here is a modeling study of the spread of these deep waters, both the Labrador seawater level and the overflow water. You're looking at probability maps of floats that have been released in these deep waters at high latitudes, and we're looking at their spread as they are exported equatorward. The third assumption I want to talk about is the assumption that actually Matthew Fontaine Murray, who was a 19th century naval oceanographer, um, had, and that was that the surface waters that are carried in the Gulf Stream, those surface waters move up into the eastern subpolar gyre, where they release their heat and provide the warmth that Europe feels relative to, to, the lat to Canada at comparable latitudes. What you see here is a schematic of the surface ocean cir circulation that Dave Fratt and Tony put together based on a collection of surface drifters from the 1990s. And that red ribbon shows our expected pathway for the upper limb of the overturning circulation. Why this matters so much, that upper limb, is for the reasons I just talked about that was of interest to Matthew Fontaine Murray. And that is because this return flow is responsible for a net poleward heat flux that's provided by the ocean. And that net poleward heat flux has a large influence on the local, regional, in fact, even, even global climate. 
And so one of the reasons the overturning circulation has been of interest because is if it slows or speeds up, it changes that net poleward heat flux and then has, it, has a profound influence on the neighboring climate. So that understanding of the surface um, limb of the overturning circulation started to change with this study of Brambill and Talley in 2006. So we had been looking at that upper limb principally from an Olarian view, where we were taking velocity data, averaging, bending it, and more or less connecting the dots. But when Brambell and Daddy used, used Brambell and Talley used that same data, that same surface drifter data, but instead looked at it in a Lagrangian view, the story of the throughput fell apart because of all the, those drifters that were released in the subtropical gyre, which are shown by all the asterisks, only one of them actually showed a path to the subpolar gyre. And so the question was, well, where is that surface pathway? So subsequent studies, modeling studies, and studies with some observations have asked then, well, if the surface waters aren't getting up to the eastern subpolar gyre, what is the source of those very warm waters there in that, in that area that I just talked about that are so important for the climate of the region? So you know, I have that box dashed there because a student of mine did uh, a number of studies where we looked at back trajectories from there to trace the source of those waters. And what we find is that those waters indeed do come from the subtropical ocean, but they don't come from the surface. They come from depths of about 200 or 300 or even 400 meters in the subtropical ocean at the depth of where we say, where we say resides what are called the subtropical mode waters. And so based on these studies, we have a revised geometry for the upper limb of the overturning circulation. So rather than those surface waters coming through the Gulf Stream, being fed up through the North Atlantic Current on the surface, we believe that those waters in the subtropical gyre are subject to buoyancy forcing, form a local water mass, and then they are advected at depth on up into the subpolar gyre. So this impacts our understanding of how heat and heat anomalies then are propagated along that upper limb of the overturning circulation. The fourth assumption that I mentioned before that we understood was that if we measured the overturning at one latitude, we'd be, have a very, fairly good idea about the overturning at another latitude. But a study in 2007 really shook our faith in that assumption as well. And so in this study, what you're looking at in the left panel is a, model, is a model's representation of the overturning circulation as a function of depth and latitude. And so that is a picture of the mean meridional overturning circulation, where you see the deep waters um, sinking at the high latitudes in the North Atlantic and then moving equatorward at depths of about 2,000 meters. What you're looking at on the right is a panel of the MOC anomalies. This is termed a Hovmuller diagram, where we're looking at the propagation of the anomalies as a function of latitude and in time. So if we expected the MOC anomalies or the MOC to behave comparably at one latitude compared to the other, we should be able to see that the anomalies um, at high latitudes, would, we would see those all the way as we go down um, to other latitudes. But instead what we see is that the anomalies in the, in the subpolar region can differ at times than the anomalies of the subtropical. Sometimes they might be the same, but sometimes they aren't. Certainly, overall, they aren't coherent. This certainly is different than what we had thought about before in terms of a global conveyor belt with anomalies moving continuously along that path. But we understand now that wind, uh, wind variability over different basins can impact this, um, and that the overturning at one latitude can be the result of both local and, and remote forcing. The fifth assumption is the one I want to spend a little more time on, and that is the um, assumption about the very strong linkage between deep water formation variability at high latitudes and the overturning variability itself. What I'm showing you here is a schematic of the subpolar North Atlantic, which shows the overflow waters, the Denmark Strait overflow water and the Iceland-Scotland overflow water coming across the Greenland-Scotland ridge, joining, they're both moving into the Labrador Basin, 
where they're joined by the production of the uh, Labrador seawater, and that collectively is what's called the North Atlantic deep water. Many, many modeling studies, climate modeling studies, have shown a very strong relationship between the cessation or diminishment of that production of the deep waters and a cessation or diminishment of the overturning circulation. But over the past decade, many of those of us who focus on observations in oceanography have asked, what is the observational linkage for the connection between convective activity in the northern North Atlantic and the overturning circulation? We don't have many clues to this, and we certainly don't have a complete test of this, but I'm going to give you one example where some oceanographers have looked at this closely. We fortunately have, the Germans have had instruments in the Labrador Basin for many years, almost two decades now, where they have continuously made measurements of the deep western boundary current transport as well as measurements of the property fields and the convective activity in that basin. And what you're looking at here, I'm first going to draw your attention to the red arrow, and I'm going to tell you that over the time period shown here from 1997 to about 2009, during that time period, there was an increasing temperature of the Labrador seawater. That increasing temperature of the Labrador seawater implies that there was a decrease in the convective activity in the Labrador Sea, which was what we had expected based on the North Atlantic Oscillation over those, over those years. With every expectation that a decrease in that convective activity should have been accompanied by a decrease then in the deep western boundary current transport. And what you're looking at above that red arrow are the time series of all these many moorings of the different depths that were on those arrays that the Germans have been maintaining over these many years. And in fact, there's no reduction, actually no sign of any change whatsoever of that deep western boundary current transport over those many years of the convective activity, um, the, or the, the decline in the convective activity. So how can that be? This isn't a complete measure of the overturning. I mentioned before that the deep western boundary current at places doesn't capture all the overturning. We also know, based on theoretical modeling and other observational studies, that the buoyancy forcing in that Labrador Sea does not give us a complete understanding of how much deep water we have formed. And how much deep water we have formed is not necessarily the same amount of deep water that we're going to be exporting. When I was in graduate school a fair number of years ago, I learned that if we produce seven spheratips of Labrador Sea water and seven spheratips of overflow water, we could sum those and come up with our overturning circulation, and changes in those from one year to the next would give us the changes in the overturning circulation. We're not so sure now we can do that math that simple. So after I've gone through each of these five assumptions, and I've sort of um, talked about what we don't know, I do think it's important to say, well, what do we know about this overturning circulation? We do know that the vast majority of the global basin is filled with water that originated in the North Atlantic. Those deep waters that spread equatorward, we know that they are upwelled via um, wind-driven upwelling in the Southern Ocean and also via mixing in the Indian and Pacific basins. We know that the energy that's required to drive that upwelling and that mixing is provided both by winds and by tides. And we know that this overturning provides an important component of the global poleward heat flux that drives our global climate and has a strong impact on a regional climates as well. But what we really are still wanting to understand is the variability of that overturning circulation. Now, when it comes to understanding the variability in the long term, so looking down the road in the 21st century, we're going to take advantage of a suite of climate models that have been run with, for the IPCC assessment, and we're going to look at those suite of models under different emission scenarios, the four different emission scenarios listed here. Almost all of the models show that in the next century, in the following century, there's an expectation that there will be a diminishment of the overturning circulation. And you'll see at the bottom that the IPCC fifth assessment says that there will be redu a reduction of 11% to 34%. 
The IPC assessment also said what we know in the intervening decade or so since that NRC report is that the overturning circulation is much more stable than we thought it was at that time. And so it's viewed as highly unlikely to undergo an abrupt transition or collapse in the 21st century. But when we look at those climate models, instead of focusing just on the long, long, long-term trend that shows us that in the next century we expect a decline, in the near term, they have very different means. They have very different uh, variability on the time scale of, you know, of even decades. And so we're interested in that variability on time scales of years to decades. So what do we know about that? The variability overturning circulation on that time scale rather than on time scale of centuries. So what have we seen lately? I mentioned that we've had the rapid array was put in place since 2004. And after that first year that showed really strong variability there, a lot of focus was on looking at the seasonality and the intraseasonal variability. But we have now 10 years, and we can start looking to see if there's any trends in the overturning circulation based on that record. So in that IPCC fifth assessment report, they put together the rapid record, which is what you see in red. They also looked at a time series at 41 North, which is a, t a time series of the overturning circulation at that latitude, reconstructed with Argo data and sea surface height information. And they looked at a um, partial measure of the overturning circulation at 16 north as part of what's called the move array. That array is measuring the deep limb, the deep components of the overturning circulation. And based on that collection of those three time series, the IPCC uh, fifth assessment report said there was really no significant trend in the overturning circulation over those 10 years. So that was uh, published in 2013 or 2014, but last year a study came out by Schrockus and Bryden, and there they have a few more years of the data of the overturning circulation time series at the 26.5 north. And what they concluded in that study is that the AMOC has been declining at a rate of 0.5 spheres per year, 10 times as fast as that predicted by climate models. They go on to note in the paper that it is unclear if this is related to global, or global warming or if it's related to background uh, climate variability. Now, 10 years is not a very long record for us to ascertain whether there's something long-term or whether this is part of a decadal signal. And so just this past year, um, a new study came out, Eleanor Fracco williams was able to extend that rapid data back to 1993 by using sea surface height anomalies as a proxy for upper mid-ocean transport. So what you see in black is her reconstructed time series for the meridiana overturning circulation at 26.5 degrees north, and she's comparing it to the actual time series, which is in red. And her proxy is able to capture 90% of the variability over that observational record. So we have pretty good faith that then her reconstruction from 1993 on to the start of the observational period is doing a very pretty good job of capturing that variability. And so now when we look at that 20-year record of the overturning circulation at 26.5 degrees north, Eleanor Fracco williams says that there is a reduction of minus 0.3 spheres per year, but that reduction is not significant. So where are we? So on the observational side, we do not have a complete or a, a clear understanding of the connection between convective activity and overturning variability, even though Many models, ocean models, climate models, show a very strong linkage and show in the years ahead that that is what's going to, uh, that linkage is what's going to uh, cause the diminishment of the overturning circulation. We also know, though, that freshening and warming at high latitudes continue apace. Many studies have shown these property changes at high latitudes, and those are the property changes that we, that we expect to stabilize 
the waters, its surface in the high latitudes, and we would expect those waters then to create a diminishment of the water mass formation. So the overturning um, many studies as well uh, illustrate the impact of changes in the overturning circulation as well. So these um, concerns, the lack of that uh, linkage between convective activity and overturning variability, um, and really trying to understand this, led um, to a new program that was launched by the international community. Actually, it started in about 2010. So there are seven countries that came together for this program and understood the need to have an observing system in the high latitudes of the North Atlantic. So why in the high latitudes of the North Atlantic? This is where we have the deep water production in the Labrador Sea, where we have the waters from the Arctic Ocean coming over the sill, so where we can measure those overflow waters um, that are coming into the subpolar basin, and where we can really understand the mechanistic link between deep water formation each and every year and the overturning variability itself. The measurement at 26 North is absolutely critical as part of this observing system because we do understand, as I mentioned before, that we need in more, more than one measure of the overturning variability. So this system was put in place to really complement that and we also have a program going on now in the South Atlantic that is also going to be giving us a comparable measure of the overturning circulation there. So we really have this suite of observing systems that in the years ahead will give us a much more comprehensive view of the overturning circulation in this Atlantic basin. The OSNAP array was deployed in the summer of 2014. It has a it's a system of uh, boundary arrays that extend from Labrador over to Greenland, over to the west coast of Greenland, and then the east coast of Greenland, all the way over um, to the west coast of Scotland. In addition to these moored arrays that are measuring the current, the velocities, and also the temperature and the salinity, we're using gliders that are measuring the temperature and salinity and the velocities in the upper thousand meters at some sections along the way. And then coupling um, these measurements is also a float program where we're tracking for the very first time with subsurface floats the pathways of the overflow waters. As I mentioned before, we've tracked observationally the pathway of the Labrador seawaters, but we've never tracked in Lagrangian frame the pathways of the, um, of the overflow waters. The first uh, complete measurement set will come out this summer. So we have a series of five cruises starting in May, and the last of the uh, data will be recovered um, in August. The instruments are going back in because we'll have measurements for this first stage for five years. But we'll have our first set of data um, in fall of next year to make the first direct measurement of the overturning circulation in the subpolar North Atlantic. We'll have that available next fall and to compare it to our understanding of the convective activity. So in summary, over this past decade or two, our conceptual understanding of the ocean's overturning circulation has really been advanced primarily through um, observational studies, but also through some modeling studies. And I do want to emphasize that it's been primarily, or in large part, not only through Olarian studies, but through Lagrangian studies. The Lagrangian view along uh, drifters and floats has really been instrumental in changing our mind about the structure of the overturning circulation. So today we understand that the overturning circulation has strong variability on seasonal and subseasonal timescales. It's no longer sufficient to think that we can take a synoptic measure and have that represent the overturning circulation for one year, much less one decade. We understand that the deep western boundary current is not the sole conduit for the lower limb of the overturning circulation. We have important interior pathways that are spreading tracers and waters into the interior. We understand that the surface waters of the Gulf Stream are not fed directly up into the subpolar North Atlantic gyre, and we have to revise the geometry of that upper limb to include some of the buoyancy forcing and the subsequent spiraling in the subtropical gyre.
We also understand that it's not sufficient to understand the overturning circulation at one latitude and think we understand what it is at latitudes to the north or to the south. So we've had these revisions about the geometry and the temporal scale on which that um, overturning circulation varies. But overall, what, we, what we is, remains unanswered is the question about the overturning variability. But this is where I think that the observations will make a huge contribution in the years ahead. We have many wonderful ocean models out there that have done a great job in terms of um, reproducing very realistic um, overturning circulations. But in terms of getting the variability correct and correct on certain time scales, what's really needed is an important ground truth thing. In addition to providing this ground truth thing, what we hope is that the whole array that we have assembled of this overturning um, this OSNAP program, we hope that in the years and decades ahead, we're able to design a much more efficient system by using a few key measurements, satellite observations, and models so that we have long-term measurement system in place of this overturning uh, circulation. And in large part, we're doing this because we're very interested in how this circulation feature um, is important to our evolving climate. So with that, I'm going to thank you for your attention, and I will be happy to answer any questions at this point. Thank you, Karen. I appreciate it. Thank you for that wonderful talk, Susan. If you have questions, please stand up and um, present yourself to the microphone so that the audience can hear you. And I will take a question here to start with. Great, Susan, that was a great talk even for you. Um, she always gives talks. talks. Great talk, even for you. Oh, <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. So, but I know one of, the, the, one of the things we want to do here is be a little provocative. I could argue that when it comes to the deep pathway, that this really represents physical oceanographers catching up to what by the chemists have known for I, decades. I but, couldn't agree more. And yeah, so I, going forward, what's the role of tracers and so forth in, in, in looking at that variability? Because you can argue that, in fact, maybe things like CFCA show are better measures of that variability than the direct physical measurements. Yeah, no, that, that is a good point. I do agree with you I, about the, what the, uh, the biogeochemist or the geochemist knew for a while because they were looking at the tracers and, un, and understood the spread. Physical oceanographers were making measurements in the deep western boundary current and saying, yes, we have a deep western boundary current, and yes, we see high latitude water you know, uh, property variability in, in the boundary current. Moving forward, I don't want to pretend that there's one type of measurement that's going to give us an understanding of that variability. And so absolutely, tracers are, are part of that. I'm focusing on this because, in large part, I think we um, really need to understand the dynamics. So I'll push back on you a little bit because um, even today, people will take a temperature signal um, and make an interpretation based on what is sea surface temperature changes over a number of years and make an interpretation on the dynamics that produced that temperature signal. So if we see a cooling in the, in the subpolar North Atlantic, that must mean that the overturning circulation um, has slowed. So I think there's a danger in taking just the property information and inferring dynamics. So we need the collection of the, of the dynamics with the, with the property fields to make those, those assessments. So I mean, I will just take rapid and just say that the, those 10 years, or now 13 years of rapid data, have really, I think, um, helped us move forward our understanding to a, to a large degree. So I'm actually going to ask about the surface temperature in the North Atlantic. Um, I'm, I'm mostly out of curiosity. I know that the, one of the dominant features in the recent year has been the cold pool forming off of, off of southern Greenland. And I'm curious how that may fit into the dynamics you've talked about with the running on overturning. Yeah, you know what? I just answered an ang a question before it was asked. I don't know if anybody noticed. So, yes, so there's been a, a lot of attention about the cold blob in the North Atlantic. And so what I was answering in, um, in, in uh, Anad's question, I said that um, 
I believe, and I think there are colleagues who believe with me, that um, it is perilous, should be a little provocative like Anand was saying, I think it's perilous to take a property signature and infer the dynamics. There are many different dynamics that could produce that same uh, property signature. So I'm not convinced that that cooling that's been persistent for 18 months in the North Atlantic is a sign of the overturning, of the slowing of the overturning for reasons that I just showed you today here. But we also know that the past year in particular, there were very strong air sea fluxes that produced very intense cooling in the subpolar North Atlantic. So I would say the jury is still out on whether that signal is indeed indicating an overturning variability. Dick Barber. Susan, thank you for a very clear uh, discussion. In, in the last slide that you showed us in your summary, the Hope Mueller uh, figure in uh, latitude, uh, latitude time space, yes. the signals were vertical. I would expect that they would be some slant and that one portion would lead um, the other and, and actually double slant that the subsurface anomalies should have the opposite slant of them. You were looking very closely, Dick. That is very nice. So um, in those Hofmuller diagrams, if we see things vertical, then we expect fast propagation. And so that would be a signal that those, uh, those MOC anomalies are propagating by waves um, along, along boundaries, by density anomalies along boundaries. And so where we see those slants, then we expect them to be propagated um, via advection. And so um, what we currently understand is that some of those signals are propagated via waves and then some are, are via advection. The main thing I was trying to point out in that, though, is sort of the, the break in the anomalies um, at that gyre-gyre boundary. There has been work done by Rong Zhang, which talks about fast propagation at subpolar latitudes and then slower. We would see more of a slant in the subpolar, in the subtropical, because of the advective pathways. So. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm wondering, do the, the climate models consistently predict a, a decrease in overturning, but are they also all consistently making those assumptions that you've had us question today? Um, let's see, are they making those assumptions? I mean, they are uh, coupled models, atmosphere and ocean. So you mean like if you looked in them, would the deep western boundary current uh, carry, all of the, be, carry all of the deep waters equatorward? Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Um, I think it's safe to say that the, um, probably the characteristics or the geometry of the overturning circulation in each of those gyres is slightly different and probably isn't as a really strong replication of what we're seeing in the real ocean, primarily because of resolution. I think when we moved, or I know when we moved to our high resolution ocean circulation models, we start to see changes in the pathways and changes in how the tracers are, di are distributed. But I don't think that the reason they see that strong linkage necessarily has to do with, with the geometry. Monica. Thanks, Susan, for this really exciting talk. Um, I want to go back to the subpolar North Atlantic and to the exchange between the western part and the eastern part. Uh, since 2006, we measure the volume transport of the North Atlantic current flowing from the western, crossing the mid-Atlantic ridge. And we also have um, instruments out at 47 North, where we have 110 severe drop arriving in the subpolar North Atlantic. And out of them, uh, about 30 severe drop cross into the eastern Atlantic, and 20 severe drop of them is warm subtropical water, which also uh, transports not only temperature but also salinity anomalies. Yes, yes. And the variability is high. Yes. It's very high, but there is the mean doesn't change in the last 20 years. But I think the Wait. the the in, because we could extend this like uh, in the paper for Freiker Williams, we extended our time series back to 1992 with the altimeter data, and. 
So I think that this disconnect uh, you had in your slide between the Western Atlantic and the Eastern Atlantic is, 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 is not what, what, uh, what the measurements show. The measurements show there is part of the, of the North Atlantic kind crosses, and they also, we see when we look at time series of salinity in the Eastern Atlantic that part of the signal comes from the Gulf Stream or from the North Atlantic kind crossing into the eastern part. So it's not that disconnected as you have. Uh, and, um, oh, you uh, mean alluded oh, you're, to in your in your talk? You're talking about the surface pathway, yes. yeah. yeah. So, and I will. I didn't go into all the details, but certainly in those back trajectories, a large fraction of it does come from the surface waters in the subpolar gyre. But I was talking about the origin of this of the subtropic. But I'm happy to talk to you about it more, Monica, especially since you are the expert in subpolar North Atlantic dynamics. Thank so, you. thank you. <laughs> are we doing on time? I'm a biological oceanographer, so I want to ask a question from a biological point of view. That is, at uh, a given latitude, like 26, you know, if we go on a vertical basis, you see Gulf Stream, Western Boundary Undercurrent, and even Antarctic bottom water. Right here in the last couple of days, I hear people talking about Southern Ocean. The Antarctic bottom water is weakening. And I also hear some areas in the North Atlantic, mainly the eastern part, upwelling process is slowing down. And so my question is, can we make generalization based on one latitude or should we have <laughs> observatories in more places? I'm going to first I'm going to answer your question in just a moment, but when you got up and you said you had a biological oceanography question for me, I had a flashback, so if you can just permit me 30 seconds. When I went to interview at Duke University for my faculty position, I went down to the Duke Marine Lab, uh, Dick Barber um, invited me down there, and fresh out of Woods Hole, physical oceanography, I talked to these marine biologists about potential vorticity dynamics in a Lagrangian frame. And I was talking about the subtropical ocean and all these little Grangian parcels moving around. And then at the end of the lecture, someone slowly raised their hand and they said, well, what implications does this have for sea turtles? <laughs> sea turtles? Anyway, I still got the job, so I came up with some answer. But here, here I am glad, even though a biological oceanographer was asking me, you asked me a physical oceanography question. I, we cannot make generalizations based on what's happening at one latitude. So even about that Antarctic bottom water changes. And so that's why it's really important for us to have this ocean observing system in the South Atlantic, in the subtropical North Atlantic, and at high latitudes. And we know there's you know, many things are spinning up now in the Southern Ocean as well. And so I think oceanographers, you know, we've been data poor for a long time. And so our understanding of the dynamics and variability has really been uh, hindered by that, you know, compared to the, you know, to the atmospheric scientists. So I'm very excited about uh, the years and decade ahead because that data coming in will really advance the field.